as a keyboardist and uh, also as a singer you told me about your main uh, thing is actually the keyboard and such side of things and also music producing so I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you and uh, thank you for having me here. Um, it's really been a tough process trying to complete a PhD uh, after trying to figure out what I want to do in life. Um, really, uh, Florian has been very kind in trying to put it into simple words but sometimes uh, to decide what your calling is takes longer than you think and here I am um, at the age of 35 having submitted my um, dissertation and having been unable to defend it here um, I was going to come with a heads up and say look uh, this is what I did and I was able to get it passed and accepted by a scientific community but here I am to report sort of a failure and uh, hoping to remand, um, redeem the situation in the coming three months, uh, the presentation styles with the demo of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Mrs. Hyde, of course, in my case, uh, writing a practice deck dissertation on metal musicians. Is there any other way to really infiltrate the world of metal musicians? Is there any other way than being one yourself? Uh, I couldn't figure out one, but um, here I am to at least give some perspectives on what the procedure was, uh, if I managed this or not. So this is the title of my dissertation, Music non Literate Virtuosi, the Alive the Metal Band Performer. I kept the Turkish word because um, the English definition, as you can see here, is many worded. I couldn't put it into one single word and the word autodidact doesn't entirely cover it because uh, it doesn't really give you the case where you would have someone to learn from, someone like a master, someone like your mentor. So in that case, if that someone is not giving you an institutionalized way of uh, learning music, exploring musical terminology and music theory on written notation, then it would still not be in the context of learning institutional, in an institutional way. So I kept the Turkish word. And the themes that I try to explore uh, are the pedagogy of metal music, the local metal scene in Istanbul, but um, Istanbul is in particular, of course, it's basically Turkey in general, I should say, intra-band communication. How um, does a metal band go through the procedures of uh, production? What do they do when they are ready to make their debut in terms of publishing something, which is, of course, much uh, easier now in the digital realm with um, iTunes and um, the possibility of just publishing an output by just paying like $30 or something. This is much more accessible than uh, those tape trading era musicians that we are now looking up to. Uh, so my research question is basically what communication processes uh, do a lot of these uh, self-trained musicians, non-institutional trained musicians and occult schooled musicians um, go through when they work together in a metal band. So, um, of course, the question emphasizes the process, but it's of course a bit difficult to build a PhD project upon a question which is not a poll question, it's not a result-oriented question. Um, so the subtext that goes with this question is first highlighting if there is a communication problem, which I thought I was uh, out of my autobiographical experience, basically. Uh, going into the metal scene as an adult newcomer who has to learn the practices. Um, of course, I can tell you what a um, Shakerian Grunsatz is, but I can't really tell you what the riff is if you were to ask me 10 years ago. So um, is this problem of non-communicativeness a detrimental issue in music making? Um, is it arising from a background environment or the genre itself? Where does it come from? Uh, is a process to work through this problem really necessary? Is there a solution? Is this solution applicable in the wider sense? Is it really more or less a similar story for other bands or other uh, contexts where you would have musicians coming from different backgrounds working together. Does this problem extend to, for example, a jazz pianist trying to work with an electric guitarist? Or is it only coming from a Western classical training? 
Um, is it really the origin of this problem? Okay, what does my dissertation contain? Um, this was really, really hard to crystallize. Uh, a brief definition and review of metal music, there was no way around it. A status report about the Turkish experience of metal music. There is scholarly research on the Turkish scene, as uh, you might know by Dr. Hekar, who is uh, also my advisor. Uh, he's now working in Marburg University. So uh, his field was basically uh, the Turkish metal scene up to the year 2008 to 2010. He's been doing some later research on the scene, uh, but um, basically I tried to take over where he left and I was uh, both cursed and blessed to observe some profound political and economical changes affecting the scene. And then first-hand experience of learning a new musical practice. This is of course specific to metal in my case, but uh, really little is written on learning the practices of another genre of either popular music or art music uh, in the sense of um, getting to become a performer. Of course there is uh, a lot of um, emphasis, especially in ethnomusicology. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, of course, uh, John Blacking and his music in con concept. But um, to your eyes on it, there's just not enough uh, scholarly output, and you can't generalize it across genres, if you ask me. And then comes detailed analysis of jargon techniques used in metal music, metal music production. Uh, there is a comparison of institutional learning and colloquial learning of music, a um, composition practices of an emerging band, uh, world-class musicians relating their learning and practicing procedures, informal learning practices of especially young metal musicians, social profiling of individuals who prefer to listen to metal music in Turkey, uh, inner workings of global and global metal music industry, and finally discussions on identity, authenticity, and virtuosity concerning metal musicianship. Uh, actually, when I present all of this to you, it's like, oh, this dissertation must be 600 pages long, which it was in terms of draft, but uh, it, um, you have to really, really truncate things and limit things, otherwise it just doesn't work. So what did I decide to leave aside along the way? Extreme metal? Because I was never able to really be accepted into the scene, basically, as basic as that. Uh, gender discourse on the experience of the female metal musician. I find it a bit too trivial, actually. I want things to be um, on an equal basis. We're always uh, talking about the feminist discourse in the scholarly world, but aren't we just in a way, paving the ground for just uh, highlighting this discourse to be on a less equal basis. Um, I just wanted to evaluate um, my um, basis, my standing, um, in a way of musical meritocracy. So I didn't really want to just go into the realm, look, I'm a female musician, so that's why uh, this is the experience that I'm having. Um, okay, and uh, I didn't go into detailed musical definitions or analysis or theoretical definitions of analysis of metal songs, term, uh, texture, timbre, harmony I left aside. Um, there is just no manual to tell a young emerging musician to become a world metal artist, and I'm not writing one either. Uh, or uh, it's not a manual or advice about forming a band, trying to go through these uh, communication issues uh, or social media management or booking. Um, I do have, of course, some um, review of the technology that's used to write and disseminate a metal song, but uh, I'm not going to teach anyone to use Guitar Pro, obviously. Uh, statistical outcomes relying on large N analysis and collected data. This has avoided me. I couldn't reach as many informants that I wished. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, this uh, limited uh, scope of informants uh, also denies me the quantitative analysis. Um, so I don't really boast direct uh, yes, no follow-up questions, outcomes, I'm sorry, or uh, anything that can be really associated with hard science in that sense. It's really, really social science we're talking about. Uh, here are my content sources, what I had to gather together into a scholarly text. 
First of all, uh, there's a lot of ethnographic data. This is a dissertation coming from 2010. The project was accepted in 2013. So um, I haven't really been building my discourse upon hard copies of um, Billboard or Kerrang. Um, not that I have neglected altogether such uh, sources, but at least I had to <laughs> filter uh, them down to um, mostly social media. And then, of course, there's my own field notes in the field um, in terms of both as a practicing musician and as an observing person. And then, of course, uh, thanks to the efforts of the scholars and all this expanded, wonderful uh, IM, MMS, uh, whatever, um, people. <laughs> uh, so it has really been a vibrant corpus of research in, in the last decade and without that I don't think anybody would um, support my venture of going into a metal dissertation basically uh, from the Turkish perspective it's still a bit uh, you know um, not stable ground but uh, I could justify these efforts by saying okay this is um, now worldwide accepted research with very venerable scholars uh, who are giving this marvelous output, so that was really justifiable. And finally, I got the chance to interview uh, music professionals uh, in terms of uh, what they do in life as a, as a day job, basically, people who do music as a day job. Uh, this interdisciplinarity, I can't really talk about transdisciplinarity since this is a project that concerns a musicologist and I don't have the grounding to really go deep into, for example, psychology of music. Uh, these are just a break up of uh, my sources. So according to what kind of emphasis they have, what kind of methodologies they present. So I do have, of course, um, many different um, main sources, so to speak. For example, music pedagogy and education. Uh, who was mentioning? I think Eugene was mentioning today, Lucy Green. Um, her output has been really, really uh, fundamental for me. Or uh, in terms of music sociology, if you're working through a scene which is always a bit out of the mainstream, like the Turkish scene, then you have to go through uh, sources that have a sociological or even anthropological um, cast to them, for example, like um, Dr. Haker's work. Uh, what about musicology? Where does it come from? Um, basically, of course, in order to, especially from a schooled person's perspective, uh, write about this new experience. What I mainly do is um, ethnomusicological methods such as feedback interviewing. This is a method coined by Ruth Stone in the 1980s, where she would show, for example, videos that are taken uh, during a ritualistic performance of um, sub-Saharan uh, music to its practitioners that ask about um, what they had in mind while they're performing a particular aspect in that way. So that I tried to do, uh, for example, by filming uh, performances of underground metal bands and then showing them. Uh, so what were you thinking? What kind of communication you would like to have with your um, audience when you're doing such and such a, an act on the stage. Uh, so this is basically my workflow. Um, so without the practice as research, I wouldn't have um, the, my face wouldn't have the recognition value to interview with professional metal musicians because that goes through, of course, booking agents and um, you need to be a person who is um, visible enough to be granted audience, basically. And uh, this goes also with uh, interviews with Turkish metal scene protagonists. Otherwise, uh, probably I would have experienced a similar um, reaction like uh, Dr. Hecker did. He was often asked if he's a CIA agent or something, because everybody was, of course, a bit suspicious about um, his motives uh, without the input that Metal can be scrutinized as a scholarly subject, of course. It's a bit weird when someone from Germany comes mm -hmm. and talks to you in a sort of broken Turkish. Um, then, 
those three fed um, upon the endeavor of uh, finding these young self-taught metal musicians because you are sort of a known elder sister from the scene and everybody knows that you're doing scholarly work so they're willing to at least getting their voices heard so um, then of course there's the anonymous data um, acquired I uh, used survey monkey to get to metal musicians and fill them fill get them to fill into sort of survey um, so it's basically a circle it's uh, every aspect is leading into the next one and this is the workflow of the practice led research so there is the events there's the field notes which is not maybe as formal as the regular um, field notes of a ethnomusicologist for example there you would have your procedures you would be told to take um, a particular structure uh, it's sometimes not just possible because you have to sometimes observe events uh, in the same speed that they are unfolding so in the end I have rough text which uh, through draft and revision goes into a sort of final version uh, which is of course leaving aside a lot of things and um, the data analysis has to take into consideration that um, me as the sole um, person um, trying to figure out what's happening, I needed sort of the criticism from um, the scholarly jury that I had, a seven person jury, in order to make sense of things. Uh, mo the most typical challenge I articulated in blue is assuming a critical stance. Um, where do you stand as a researcher if you're especially within the field? Uh, that has been the um, main problem issue. That has been the dilemma, um, hence the highlight of my talk. So reading scholarly material is supposed to give you a perspective, but the trouble is um, probably there are very few metal scholars who are also going onto the stage and making music. There might be some, but I'm yet to meet them. I would be very, very uh, happy if I met someone who's doing practice led research. There is Jasmine um, actually from Britain, so I'm very happy that I found her, but uh, Jasmine Shadrach. Uh, but besides her, as far as I have explored, there's very little um, scholarly communication possible uh, on my behalf. So this is basically a methodology that is to justify, that is to render more than a thick description. Um, there is, of course, textual analysis of sorts uh, involved, especially if you're handling an ethnographic material. Um, and the same goes for my own field notes uh, in terms of practice and research. Uh, but I thought I need something more. I need something more um, inclined to uh, hard sciences. So what I found in between is this method of grounded theory approach. Uh, this is the political sciences method. And uh, it especially works very well with written text in terms of trying to code it to um, structures of meaning and then at least make more abstract generalizations and maybe uh, just lead eventually to a theory. Um, this has been a, an effort to justify and legitimize in my own terms. I was, I guess, having too much fun in the field and um, I thought in the end, um, they can just go through this rigorous routine to at least give a sense of theory to the data collected. And um, here are some final um, criticisms of practice as research. Maybe it has been uh, for the better, because how would you then, um, in, for the sake of scholarly objectivity, how would you then be credible enough uh, from the perspective of the people uh, who are giving you that input, who are uh, practitioners in the field. How do, they, how do you get them to behave the way they naturally are? Um, so um, the concept of performance has been a very um, strong argument in that I have never seen a metal band who's behaving the same way they do on stage and in the studio when they're rehearsing for that concert. I'm yet to see one. So um, in that case, um, I thought it best to really be a person who they would confide upon and treat the way um, that 
would be necessary for me to collect my data. So practice as research involves a research project in which practice is a key method. And um, it's very suitable for especially performance arts, obviously. Um, here's a formulation that I find uh, rather supportive in the 20th and 21st century, what discipline was to 18th and 19th centuries. And uh, so the ontohistorical historical formation of power and knowledge. In the sense of knowledge, of course, now there is a Thanks to Eugene's question, I just come to think information and knowledge are really two different things. So um, I will definitely elaborate upon that. Um, here are just a few people whom I interviewed. You might see familiar faces around. Um, I was really lucky enough to say, for example, uh, talk to um, Zach Wilde, as you can see here. Um, and this explains why sometimes we don't really have expansive field notes. We don't have the opportunity. <laughs> Some people just catch in uh, rather strange circumstances with this, for example, Jordan Rudis here. I was able to talk in a more calm environment, but the first time I met him, um, I had to really grab him in the middle of the uh, Frankfurt Musikmesse and try to interject questions. So it's not always um, the best opportunity, the best circumstance. First, you have to let yourself be known, let your motives be uh, known. It's not as easy and as straightforward as doing research on, you know, on an anonymous um, bands making metal music. Uh, so here are some highlights on my performance endeavor of the way. First of all, as I didn't really want to um, project too much femininity, it's just I just wanted like Nemo, uh, all black stuff and nothing that's very, very striking. And everybody thought maybe more femininity should be on the call. So that's one of the uh, art covers for a single that we have published in 2014. And this one is from 2015. So assuming this narrator stands more going into the way of what's expected, there is those of femininity expected of a female practitioner of the genre. But then I thought this is just, I don't want to be in the foreground this way. So here is the latest, this is from 2016, I would say is the latest um, canvas that we designed. Istanbul as a backdrop and I'm drawing the canvas, I'm in the background, it's the guys. And I'm writing the music for them, all right, so it's been an interesting case. Um, but it's a conscious decision that it would be this way. On the stage, though, of course, it doesn't look that way. Here are just some snapshots from a couple of um, venues that we played. This Manhattan is a jazz club, actually. Um, and this is a more like a bigger stage, a closed venue. This one is from an open air festival in Ukraine. and. Uh, this is the final concert that we gave before I had to give a call, a halt, because I was pregnant and um, I had a dissertation to write. So here I am in a country that you might code as conservative on the stage with my six month old Billy, uh, leading a bunch of prog metal guys. Uh, so here are my outcomes of the dissertation. I will just go quickly and read them. Autodidact musicians and institutional trained musicians initially do not have a musical language in common. Metal relies heavily on its performative context and often behavior and or musicianship is different in private spaces than public spaces. Metal is a vogue endured so long since production-wise it's compatible with the do-it-yourself concept of the post-social media world. Formal vocational music education does not give much of an advantage for metal musicianship. The key point is discipline and devotion. Even most extreme techniques such as brutal vocals could be learned and mastered by non-institutional learning. And music education in schools is not useful, at least from the perspective of my informants, even detrimental. Interest in metal often stems from a protest of the established order, including music schools. Essentially, making the music is in no other genre a teamwork as in metal music. A band is truly a band when every opinion matters and members stay together for a long while, a long time, also outside music. Here are my two like, strong uh, support cases for that, Metallica and Rammstein. 
Uh, legal streaming has been a trendsetter in recent years. Some very interesting metadata about listener loyalty and music consumption modes concerning metal is becoming increasingly available. Actually, I had some Spotify data and some Google Music data that my jury thought they were irrelevant, and uh, they are now in the appendix. Um, interesting, metal music has always been a middle class endeavor in Turkey. The advent of social media initially meant an expansion was um, visible uh, into the working class, but the country is becoming increasingly conservative and economically also burdened. So it's got an impact on the scene, uh, especially in the last four or five years. And well, being interested in metal means facing odds in Turkey. However, it's still an oasis compared to other Middle Eastern countries. I've been comparing notes with many scholars who are um, working upon such scenes. And really, in Turkey, still nobody uh, asks you to submit the lyrics of the songs that are going to be performed before a concert. Or you can just publish uh, rather obviously politically charged songs criticizing uh, the practices of the government. Metal has proved this adverse time, and now the fourth generation metalheads are in the making. <laughs> this is for the fun part. Uh, so I thought everything fit together in the context of at least um, defining the acculturation process of an adult uh, music professional from one musical background to the other. Um, it's got its strengths and its weaknesses. It covers the metal scene uh, between the years 2010 to 2018 in a uh, quasi at least scholarly sense. And um, it's making mention of social and economical events that has an impact on the scene. Um, it puts together the practices and perspectives of uh, professional and um, amateur metal musicians. Um, I knew that I had weaknesses, that it's not very focused, it's not really, really like a very analytical, deep, um, cutting edge work. Uh, it, I have the tendency to say too many eyes at times, and the method does not really work too well. The grounded theory method doesn't really work too well if you're considering all the culture, basically. You can't transcribe every single thing, even if you do. Um, sometimes you have to really sacrifice these um, de delusions, and uh, not delusions, but those diluting factors in terms of meaning. And I will give you one example. When I was talking to Joey Belladonna, he was really, really a bit high already. It was after his uh, stage time, so he was, I don't know how many drinks he had, but um, he couldn't really keep focus. So um, I had I was recording the interview, but my phone ran out of space at the middle of the interview. So what do I do? What can a scholar do? Uh, he's repeating the same phrases, or he's just, uh, I try to post another question and he's going back to the previous question. Uh, in those cases, really, it has been very, very helpful uh, if you're using sort of a rigorous uh, method like um, the ground theory um, method to sort through uh, and look for, sift for uh, at least a semblance of what he really means in this uh, deluge of words. So, um, of course, that is a compromise. It compromises coherence, it compromises structural integrity, um, and the fact that uh, I have to battle with like two kids and three jobs uh, sometimes uh, really kept me from formulating and um, keeping things tidy. It took longer than I planned. It took about eight years to complete the procedure. Uh, so what is the verdict then? My jury thought uh, I needed a three-month expansion period where I'm to rework basically everything. And uh, rethinking and re-evaluating my position as a, re a researcher. I'm not to be a director, but a camera. The exact wording of my advisor. Um, about my advisor, I have to interject that he's my third advisor in the run. My first advisor was expelled from the university because he signed a petition um, defending this uh, Kurdish guerrilla movement, um, um, peace for academics, or academics plea for peace. Uh, so it's a controversy. Now all the um, people who are convicted because of signing this petition are 
you know, acquitted basically. Right now, uh, nobody's pressing any charges, but back in 2017, it was a serious crime. So he lost his job for 20 years. He's an ethnomusicologist from UCLA, actually. Uh, now he's looking for a job in the States as a 60 year old. I find it utterly unfair, both on his behalf and on my behalf, as a PhD student who was working with this convicted person. I had great trouble trying to find an advisor to complete this procedure. So um, in the end, of course, his directions were invalid and I was told that I have to act as a camera at the final stage uh, of completing even the defense. So organizing conclusions in a way to answer the introductions, I perfectly agree with that. And use the methodology like a Grundsatz in the Schenkerian sense. Uh, this is still a bit eluding me, and um, I'm really happy if I would get some feedback to steer um, in the right direction. I have like one and a half month to go, and still I can't really find a way to edit, especially the practice led chapter, in the way that um, would foreground the methodology. So, uh, I really thank you for listening to this, um, I hope, interesting talk. And if it sheds light on the procedures that uh, other young PhD scholars are to follow, then I'm happy that my mission is accomplished. Uh, these are sort of my <laughs> companies, and in the middle you see my band's logo. And I'm easy to reach, just remember my name and where I work. Thank you. For, for these interesting insights of your work. Are there any questions? We have some minutes uh, left for questions. Yeah. Are you... yeah uh, thank you very much. I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll just choose one. Um, I'm interested in the, the interviews you conducted with the professional musicians where you had this photo collage. And I was wondering how effective these um, interviews were because in contrast to amateurs who don't have a lot of experience in giving interviews, these professional musicians have, gone, have given tons of interviews and I'm wondering uh, whether you compare the interview, uh, the answers they gave you in your interviews with other interview material, with magazines or, or whatever, um, and if there are significant differences or if you have found out anything substantially new in your interviews or whether they just reproduce some kind of standardized uh, interview answers they had prepared for magazines and the like. I do not think they gave standardized answers, especially um, knowing their background the way I do. I especially ask questions concerning uh, what their sentiment was uh, while they are, for example, getting the formation. Some, of course, are more inclined to create a sort of self-mythos, just like Richard Wagner. Um, the case that I can think of is Joe Satriani, whom I crazy rich. I told this booking agent, but in the end his concert was cancelled due to some, again, strange circumstance in Turkey. So, um, for example, in, on his website, he describes his learning process as almost uh, like a prodigious uh, self-learning, but he, I think he had more schooling that, than he lets on. Uh, most of my interviewees were rather honest about uh, the difficulties they had during their uh, schooling. John Petrucci, for example, says, um, it was definitely not the intention that he would have to become a person who is composing in the way that um, other people before him did, because he even refrains from listening to music in the compositional place in order not to be affected. Um, so that's why I guess he never completed his schooling, but his bandmate Jordan Lutz is schooled to boot. So um, I think they were pretty much quite forthcoming and in the interviews that they give to magazines mostly of course nobody asks about their sentiment or their uh, perspective about schooling for the most part. 
if that direct question came, um, I didn't come across it. So uh, I guess. Good. Thank you very much. A very important work you're doing. I really think that's exactly what I'm interested in. Um, perhaps you can strengthen a little bit. Um, you had a chance uh, to be or to to uh, observe it for a long time. You've been a long time as a musician with your band, mm -hmm. and I think that's really a quality most of us don't have. We have the interviews or perhaps one, two or three days in the studio or so. And I think, I don't know what, what your outcomes are in detail, but perhaps, or that's what I'm interested in about communication processes and your things you mentioned. Is there anything where you can say this is a contribution to methodology in metal studies? Perhaps that's the first question. And another comment, um, I'm at a university for performing arts and there's a lot of discussion about artistic research or arts-based research. It's a big thing at the moment. Uh, is this a uh, yeah, theme in, in your dissertation too? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh I have a feeling, and this is just speculation on my own personal observation, of course, I have a feeling if uh, someone wants to give, especially these young rebel metalheads, okay, this is the method for making metal, they would feel aversive towards it. So um, I don't know if it's the way uh, to approach them in the same epistemological way that we approach knowledge for the most part in performance arts. So it's, I guess, just against the nature of metal in a sense. Um, it's still, I mean, this rebellious attitude still draws this fourth generation that I'm talking about. They're still looking at the ideals that were put forth by their father's generation, actually, in the 80s, not even their father's generation now, if their fathers are in their 40s. Uh, so I don't know if. It will function as a counterculture. We have to maybe discuss further. Thank you for the question. It, uh, I, don't, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that you've done something really unusual, which is to show the whole PhD process, and uh, including things that didn't go so well, and that's really brilliant to, co to go up in public and say that. Uh, I didn't realise before I saw this thing how it's why it's so rare, uh, that it's so rare. Because you doing it made me realise that I hadn't seen that before. Someone saying, no, I didn't get through my fiber and all that sort of stuff. I just want to say it's brilliant that you've done that. So I'm really grateful that you have. It's really so rewarding to hear this from you. And also Rosie has been giving me um, particular insights about, like in the announced conference actually, what to do next. So thank you really. Without your support, I think I wouldn't have the guts here to sit, stand and scream out, I guess, uh, failure in my sense. Let's see how it turns out yeah, in yeah, the yeah. month to come. The process. Yeah. The thing is that this is what the PhD is and should be, it's just normal. But the problem is, is that because people go to conferences and they present ready for work, they don't show this part of the process and I think they should. Thank you. The PhD is hard and miserable at times, and I think it, you know it's important. Mine was. <laughs> I think it's important to to um, to talk about that. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. I could only uh, agree with that. Uh, <laughs> some experience now they for for since some years for for uh, uh, combining uh, PhD processes. It's just these books don't get finished by themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, also, it was the same with my own dissertation. So, so it's, uh, uh, as you see, we are all grateful for being that courageous to share also not only the results, but, but the difficulties. And uh, the question what, that I had uh, was also uh, because regarding your own position and uh, because you, you, you emphasized that it uh, kind of artistic research in the way that you did has actually to build particularly on your own uh, experience as an artist. So uh, my question was, because you were pointing to that 
uh, many of your informants told you that formal uh, education was not that helpful to them, obviously, or they at least told it. A part of that might be a myth, I would guess. So a little bit, uh, but anyway, so, but you are a trained person, a, tra a trained musician. So uh, my question is, to what extent uh, could you uh, make use of your formal, uh, for your former training in the metal scene and in the metal world? Well, um, the person who has been the inspiration for all this work is um, my husband now. And I couldn't teach him in 11 years that we spent, uh, as people knowing each other, and nine years that we spent making music together, uh, that this side of the guitar fretboard is not down but up, because the frequency is going up. So um, if I could use my own background to a uh, shaping, uh, of the people around me, I tried and the um, lesson I learned was it was wiser to refrain from that. <laughs> no, I mean, to your own, to your own music making. I mean, because mm -hmm. you are a performer of mm -hmm. your own and you're not I mean, a, no, I uh, so I don't ask you as a music teacher, but as a music performer. So mm -hmm. to what extent could you, have, could you uh, make uh, use of your, your training, your uh, uh, extensive training and uh, in, in music, uh, when, when you perform uh, on a keyboard and, mm -hmm. and uh, We're making progress in metal, which is already maybe the most learned genre within the metal spectrum. And if you want to write a song that has uh, polyphony inside and different textures and synthesizer uh, tones and colors, then it's good that you have a perspective about, for example, orchestration. It helps a lot. Uh, trying to decide where in the spectrum you would like a particular sound. So that sort of knowledge is uh, inherent uh, thanks to my training and maybe it's harder for a person who's coming from a colloquial background to uh, determine uh, such decisions in their composition procedure. And um, the difficulty was mainly working outside, for example, standard notation and being more proficient with uh, MIDI notation. There you are just looking at lines and durations instead of um, the symbols that we have been very uh, pleased with for the past thousands, uh, thousand years, this uh, score reading and everything. So um, it does have its advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is that you're slower than a person who's like uh, really learned through practice and therefore can really concoct a song much quicker than you do. You become inherently less satisfied because you hear, oh, okay, maybe here I didn't want this, but there's an allusion to um, a particular work by J.S. Bach. Uh, you, you are conscious about that and it bogs you down at times. Thank you very much for that enlightening um, illumination. I, I just wondered about the Grundesans, uh, because I was a former prisoner of Schenker, uh, and I just wondered what it was in the, the agenda that a Grundesans would offer you. Is it because the work within metal was perceived as tonal, that you would find uh, three to one, five, four, three to one, or, you know, I mean, could you explain a little bit more about that peculiarity in demands made of you? Uh, actually, the word Grundsatz are used figuratively uh, for me to give more emphasis and uh, put the methodology in a more central position. Uh, the foreground, again speaking in Schenkerian terms, was just so crowded that at times the Grundsatz was indeterminable. That was the criticism that my musicologist advisor gave me. So, um, in the end, you have to really maybe tone down some personal, especially, observations and speculations and uh, just leave them very naked, very observable for the Grunsatz to emerge. Uh, I just use it there uh, as a sense of rep the reprimand I got uh, in this dissertation defense in the last month. So, uh, this is used in a more colloquial, more figurative sense. I didn't really try to analyze a particular metal song or metal songs uh, in the Schenkerian sense. But it will be interesting if someone tries. Okay, I think uh, 
that's it basically. We're, uh, uh, it's just short over 6, 6 p.m. So thanks again for yeah. that. Okay, we are kind of, but, but we were all uh, we were all listening to for yes, uh, all music. I, I think it's highly <laughs> recommended. Thanks, and uh, yes, maybe you have read what to say.